We all say it, that code is bad, this code is terrible. But what does it mean and what should we do about it? That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe and if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Bad code is probably a bad name for bad code, but at least colloquially, if not technically, we all know what we mean when we say it. That is, not how I would have done it, or if it's our code that's bad, it's not how I'd do it now with the benefit of hindsight. Bad code is code that is difficult or at least unpleasant to work on. In this episode, I want to explore what bad code really is, what's a sensible practical definition for good code, and what it takes to build good code and avoid traps in bad code based on some real world examples. Fundamentally, bad code is defined, I think, by two things. Either it doesn't do what it should, or even if it does do what it should, it's too hard to change it when we need to change it. I'd argue that that's it. Everything else is secondary to those two things. If it does what it's meant to, and it's easy to change, then it's good code. This is not about engineering as art, or over-engineering, or software developers being over-precious about the beauty in their code. This is practical, pragmatic stuff. It works and it's easy to change. These things have a direct bottom line impact on the productivity as well as quality of the systems that we build. If you want to go quickly and build lots of features, you don't get to do that by cutting corners and writing bad code fast. You do it by working more carefully to create good code from the start. And so, saving lots of unnecessary time and effort correcting the fallout that your bad code caused later on. I wish that more of us techies believed that and defended that idea more strongly to misguided people pressuring us to cut corners to deliver faster, because cutting corners simply doesn't work. The DORA data says that teams that produce higher quality code are significantly more efficient overall spending 44% more of their time on producing new features than teams that don't. 44%! That's a big win. Quality matters for commercial reasons, because we go faster overall and we create better quality code. So as software professionals, we have a professional duty of care to do a good job. This is not about self-indulgence or over-engineering. This is what we are paid to do, our professional duty of care to build software as efficiently as we can. To do that, we need to build high quality software, not create crap quickly. Because if we optimize to build crap quickly, then the data says that we just end up building bad software more slowly. The worst of all possible outcomes. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We are extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic and Semaphore. Equal Experts is a consultancy built on the idea of applying the techniques that we talk about here to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology startup applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. And Semaphore are leading suppliers of cloud-based deployment pipeline technology support for your projects. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, please do click on their links in the description to below to show them your support. So if bad code is so important, what is it and what do we do to avoid it? Here is ChatGPT's take on defining bad code. It's not perfect, but it's also not a bad summary either. So if bad code is hard to maintain, then clearly it isn't easy to change. If it has scalability issues, then it doesn't really work as it's meant to. And all of these other things also fall into my two categories of doing what it's meant to and then being easy to change. Which I think are the simpler, more foundational and more useful ideas fundamentally. Good code needs to fulfil its purpose and be easy to change. Everything else is just a special case of those two things. It's possible that I'm being a little bit overly reductive here. But in this case, I don't really think so. Because I can make my code scalable 
or write it to eliminate security vulnerabilities, and it still might be bad code if it's hard to maintain or offers a poor user experience. So if we fix all of these things, is the code good now? Well, maybe, maybe not. To achieve good code, our code needs to fix all of these things, and depending on context, probably several more not listed here. If uptime matters a lot to my business, resilience may be a much more important defining characteristic of my system's quality than, say, scalability. So code that isn't resilient is bad too, but that isn't covered in this list. In this case, a detailed list is less helpful really than a generic statement of principle, because we may always miss something off the list. So although bad code is often defined with lists like these, these aren't really definitions, but rather only reminders of some of the things that we probably need to get right depending on our context. But using the more fundamental definition of code as something that fulfills its purpose and is easy to change, is always true. So I think is a much more useful tool to help guide our choices. But let's dig in a little bit deeper than that. Most lists of things that describe code as bad look something like this, and often they start with readability. The problem with this is that it's my impression that what we mean when we say readability matters when comparing good code and bad is often, rather ironically, lost in translation. I quite like this from the C2 wiki, and one of the most amusing things about it are the comments. There's a link in the description to those if you want to check them out. The comments argue quite a bit ab about the ins and outs of these five lines of code and the coding practice exhibited by them, which goes to show that good and bad are somewhat subjective ideas when we get too lost in the detail. Though code that fulfills its purpose and code that's easy to change are a lot less subjective, closer to real measures of practical outcomes that really matter to us. But back to my current point. Fundamentally, readability doesn't mean that you, the author, can read it. Of course you can. In the moment that you wrote it, you must be able to read it, otherwise you couldn't have written it. But that is nowhere close to good enough, not a high enough bar to strive for. Readability means considerably more than that. I think that the best code is readable by almost anyone who understands the problem being solved, technical or not. If you're writing medical software, a non-programming doctor would understand the core logic of your system with some help. If you're writing a game, a game player should be able to follow the logic of your reasoning, again, probably with some help. I think that this is a good sanity check to think of the least technical person who understands the problem being able to read and understand the intent of the code. I don't always achieve that in my own code, but I think that I usually write code that I could at least easily explain to them. Here's an example from one of my pet projects. This is a technical code, but within these constraints, I think it's readable. So let's try that out. This is a small part of some infrastructure that is meant to take a Java class and use it to generate remote calls and remote proxies to handle those remote calls, translating them into calls into a service. This code is on the receiver end of one of those remote method calls, and so represents the translation from a remote call of some kind into a local call to the code that actually does the work. None of this matters very much except as scene setting context so that you can understand the goals of this code. The class is a runtime translator and here we are registering the service that has the method that does the work and creating a translator for one specific method call within that service identified by the method parameter to this constructor. I know that I'm largely just re repeating what the code already says, but that is kind of the point. I think that this is all that you need to know to put this code into context, but let's look at the next layer down. And note, this code is internally layered and named so that each part is focused on only one part of the job. We have a layer of abstraction within this class, public methods that orchestrate the work, private methods that then do the work. So now what we want is to create a collection of parameter decoders. Here's the code for that. And sure, there's some technical boilerplate imposed by Java here for creating fixed size arrays and so on. 
which we may have to explain to our non-technical reader. But for a moment, try and separate the meaning of the intent of this code from the plumbing of how Java works. The core of what is happening here, the plumbing aside, is, I hope, pretty clear, even to our non-technical reader. We're creating a new parameter decoder for each parameter and saving it for later use. Here's the code that uses it later. When a method is invoked, this code is called and it iterates over its predefined list of parameter decoders that we stored earlier and uses them to decode each parameter in turn. And then it makes the method call with those decoded parameters. There are several things that I think help this code to be readable. Each part of the code is small and focused on a simple part of the task. I've chosen names that I aim to be descriptive in terms of the problem and their role in solving it. Given the context of the problem, I'm aiming for names that are meaningful and practically given an understanding of the context clear enough that their role in solving the problem is clear to most people, including me in the future. And in that last respect, this code was indeed readable because I wrote this some years ago and still understood it well enough now to try and explain it to you. I think that this counts as readable code. Second in this list of common problems though, with bad code is complexity. Striving for readability in the sense of easy understandability helps us to manage complexity, certainly. But even more so, working to prefer testable code helps with that too. By adopting test-driven development, it's difficult to avoid preferring testable code in our designs. It promotes greater modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction, and sensibly managed coupling. It's hard to write testable code that doesn't demonstrate those features. Let's look again at my very simple real-world code. As I said, this is part of a real-world personal project. It's not written as a demo for this video, that's why I chose it. I developed it from scratch with test-driven development and it works and does what it's meant to do. But it's also very easy to change because it is modular. It's a collection of several small pieces, each one dedicated to a small single part of the overall task. So it's also cohesive and has good separation of concerns. Because each part does one thing and everything needed to achieve that one thing is within the small relatively simple piece of code. Each piece of code interacts with others through abstractions that hide information. The constructor delegates the most complicated part of the initialization to a private method that's clearly named for what it is that it achieves in the context of the constructor. That allows me to keep the intent of the constructor clear to any reader. These abstractions hide information depending on the fewest simplest parameters to get the job done. So even internally, it's also minimally coupled to achieve its job. And each part of the code, even at the level of methods within a class, is abstracted from every other so that I can change any single method with minimal or zero impact on the others. There is more to even these few lines though. This code is clearly object oriented in terms of design. A React service method is an object and it contains a collection of instances of parameter decoders which are abstract and polymorphic and aimed at decoding specific types of method parameters. There is a state and behavior here, so it's definitely object oriented. But look a little closer. This code also has no side effects. All of the state in these things is created during its initialization and is declared final, which in Java means that it won't change once it has been initialized. So the state never changes for a given instance. This too limits unexpected changes in behavior later. And even though it's a functional idea, perhaps, here I'm using it in an OO system. So this code is behaviorally simpler and so more deterministic as a result. I'm not using this code to boast about my design or as an example of perfection. I'm sure that there are ways that it could be better. I'm always sure that there are ways that my code could be better. I don't know if you will agree with me or not, that it's readable and less complex. But even if you don't, given that it is well unit tested as a result of being built with TDD from the start, I hope that you will agree that this code is certainly easy to change. For example, I can trivially add support for new parameter types if I want to without changing any of the code that I've shown you so far. And because of the separation of concerns in my design, 
You have no idea how the transport of the data representing a method call works, or how messages are routed between caller and receiver. These are indeed separate concerns and so don't impact on this part of the code at all. I chose this code because it's real world, not some artificial example. This is what my code tends to look like when I write it. I also chose it because I think it demonstrates what I mean about using the tools of modern software engineering to guide me towards what I think are better results. By working iteratively in small steps and using tests via test-driven development as small focused experiments in design, this is the sort of code that I tend to end up with. If you'd like to learn more about that and how to do it, do check out my book. Each part here is consciously designed to be as simple as I can make it. Each part, even each function, method or variable is focused on doing one thing. And so I think that all of these things help to make this code easier to understand, more readable, and so more likely to achieve my goals for the code, whatever they may be. They also make the code much easier to change when I've got something wrong or the circumstances of the use of my code change and require me to change it to match them. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're not already a Patreon supporter, please do consider joining and supporting our channel and, and our production of this content. And thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters so far. There are lots of benefits to joining as a Patreon member and lots of additional information that you can gain from there. Thank you and bye-bye.